Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the Philip Research Morning Call. Today, we have some stock counter updates, followed by the Euro Technical Pulse and Singapore Weekly. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John for NVIDIA. John, please. Yeah, thanks, Mel, and good morning, everyone. I'll sort of run through NVIDIA's second quarter uh, 2025 results, um, which they issued on Thursday morning last week. Uh, so overall, uh, results were very positive, um, exceeded expectations on you know, very strong, still strong AI demand as well as a continued ramp in their supply. Uh, so they're, they're, because demand is so high, um, essentially whatever extra uh, quote-unquote sequential growth that they're able to to receive is just really coming from how fast they can increase their supply. Um, overall, uh, most of it was driven by obviously data center, which is their AI GPUs, their Hopper H100 and 200. Um, and, and so we, we think that um, you know, continuing moving forward, uh, obviously in, in the title of our report, you know, there's no change in the, in the growth story. Uh, the results also you know, continue to show show that this is the case. Um, they really haven't reached uh, demand supply equilibrium yet, although this is likely to happen sometime in the middle of next year, maybe in the third quarter. Um, but but we still think at least for now in the near term, you know, uh, there's so much demand uh, uh, pouring into AI investments. Uh, especially from their customers, a lot of the hyperscalers are, are continuing to to say that they rather overspend than underspend, uh, and they and and videos also continue to diverse their diversify uh, their custom customer base. So a lot more enterprises as well as sovereign nations, uh, continuing to to buy more GPUs from them. Uh, the key thing here is that basically no one has additional uh, GPUs uh, capacity, um, and so everybody's racing to just develop the, the latest the and best products, the, the latest LLMs and, and all that. And so in, able, in order to do that, they need more GPUs and, and most of the GPUs will come from NVIDIA. About 90% of it will come from NVIDIA and 10% uh, of it will come from you know, AMD and, uh, and some of the other companies like Amazon as well as Google. Um, in terms of the, the, the key, uh, uh, um, coming into earnings, the, the, the key uh, concern that investors had was you know, when would demand uh, fizzle off? Uh, and NVIDIA mentioned that, you know, actually one of the biggest reasons why demand is so strong is because a lot of their customers are seeing uh, almost instant cost savings. Um, so I mentioned that for, for a lot of these GPUs, a lot of these cus uh, enterprise customers, you know, they, they need a lot of uh, data processing and, as well as simulations and stuff like that. Um, and, and as the data sets get larger and larger, it's costing, um, if you're using... Uh, older products is cost them, costing them, taking them a longer time and costing them more money uh, and more energy. And so, uh, essentially, by upgrading to a new technology that runs faster, that can can and, and run on, on less uh, energy, it's instantly uh, saving these customers a lot of money. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's also this demand for, um, uh, I guess, uh, AI as a service or GPUs as a service, um, where a lot of the hyperscalers are actually renting out. Uh, these GPUs and uh, the the capabilities to um, maybe smaller customers like startups and, and those uh, uh, smaller companies that don't really have the uh, uh, financial backing or, or the, the the cash to go and you know, build their own data center and and uh, buy get their own GPUs um, so, and so this essentially is is uh, instant revenue as well because uh, there's so many more new generative AI companies that need to leverage uh, this technology I mean the whole premise of uh, of, of these companies is to to develop more uh, generative AI uh, solutions, uh, and so the underlying infrastructure that they require you know, just rent from hyperscalers um, like Google, Microsoft, as well as Amazon. Uh, in terms of the outlook, sorry, the, the only negative was a slight delay in their Blackwell shipments, but um, they, they, over the call they did mention that you know the only reason for this was because they actually were upgrading the, the yields, the production yields, uh, so they made some changes to the mass of of the actual uh, silicon. Um, and so no real material impact, we think, for, for 2025, fiscal year 2025, which is uh, calendar year 2024. Um, in terms of the outlook, uh, another set of, of strong uh, guidance for uh, the quarter that we're in right now, 32.5 billion, which is 80% year-on-year growth. Uh, we do think that, uh, I guess we're a little bit more bullish on it, we think that that will be closer to 33, 34 billion uh, instead, uh, given the, the history of, of basically under-guiding the last you know, year or so. Um, margins are expected to also be stable. So it's just a continuation story of demand remains strong, they're just ramping up uh, whatever products they have. 
uh, as well as as ramping up new products that they're about to to ship out in in uh, the end of twenty twenty four and and going into twenty twenty five. Um, our view is that that uh you know still very robust. I think that we are coming close to peak demand. Uh, you know, given that this is, I guess, the initial phases of uh, AI uh, investment hype is is oh, you know, coming to one year plus already. Um, but we still think that you know there's still another maybe two and a half three years left in, in terms of this investment cycle. Uh, so we're still you know still in the very early innings of it, uh, and the value proposition proposition that Nvidia can uh, has to its customers is still very high. Uh, in terms of cost savings and efficiency and all that, especially with with larger uh, uh models, uh, generative AI models, uh, inferencing models, um, as they get larger and larger, they require exponentially more power, more energy to to uh, function, uh, and that's kind of where uh, uh Nvidia will thrive. Uh, in terms of valuation, right now it's trading about thirty one times four P, uh, which you think is still fairly attractive, uh, considering uh its ten year average is close to thirty seven times, so it's trading at you think is about twenty percent discount. Uh, just based on those uh, valuations. Uh, in terms of our uh, valuations and ratings, we maintain a buy, uh, but we raise our target price to 155 US dollars up from 140 US dollars. Um, basically, we, we increase our 25 and 26 revenue and by 8%, uh, maybe to reflect a, a stronger ramp up is, is uh, GPUs. Uh, Nvidia still dominates the, 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 the GPU market, and we think that um, given its position, uh, its ability to, to uh, essentially roll out uh, new and much better products on a new basis. We expect NVIDIA to maintain a significant portion of this market share, uh, at least in the, the near to mid-term. Uh, yeah, so that's all for NVIDIA. Uh, maybe I'll hand it over to Ambrish to continue with Salesforce. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. So moving on to Salesforce second quarter results. Overall, the results were in line with our expectations with first half 2025 revenue and adjusted fat me coming in at 49 and 50 percent of full year forecasts. In terms of performance for the second quarter, total revenue it grew by about 8 percent on a year over year basis. And this was mainly because of high subscription sales for its products. So, uh, basically, uh, the two core products for Salesforce are uh, Sales Cloud and Service Cloud. So, these two products they basically contribute about uh, of about of nearly 50 percent of its total revenue. And uh, the, it basically helps companies to like uh, enhance their customer relationships and to uh, uh, automate their sales operations. So uh, the demand the demand for these two products they remain resilient and it grew by about ten percent on year over year basis. And this was mainly because of high, high average revenue per user. So management said that um, the, the, the there was a, a, a multi cloud adoption as the, the existing customers they purchased additional products as well as. Uh, they upgraded to higher, uh, higher, higher, uh, higher premium, uh, pro premium uh, subscriptions mainly to because of higher services, uh, better services. And uh, secondly, uh, the company it has been focusing on improving its profitability. So its operating margin it expanded by about a two hundred basis point on a year over year basis. And uh, this was mainly because of like uh, continuous cost efficiencies like. Uh, they uh, they uh, they uh, focused on careful sales and marketing spend, prudent head control. Uh, so, like uh, last year, the, the they uh, uh, they laid off about ten percent of its workforce, and similarly, uh, it has been uh, doing it in uh, this year calendar year twenty twenty four. So, uh, in terms of negatives, uh, the company it uh, it uh, it still uh, uh, for further uh, projects are for the slowdown in its third quarter revenue to grow by about 7% on a year over year basis. And this was mainly because of uh, macro challenges. So uh, management said that they are still witnessing uh, uh, like a cautious buying behavior from small and medium enterprises. And this is uh, uh, leading to uh, lower professional services and uh, like uh, this is mainly leading to like uh, elongated sales cycle as well as uh, deal size compressions. But despite the the slowdown in the third quarter, it still uh, reaffirmed or reiterated its full year outlook, uh, and it basically uh, uh, expects the total revenue for full year to grow by about nine percent, and this should be led by its uh, the resilient demand for its core products like the sales cloud and service cloud, and also uh, it it raised its operating margin guidance by about thirty basis point, and also raised its uh, uh, bottom line adjusted earnings per share to about ten dollars and seven cents now mainly because of continued focus on high operating leverage. 
in terms of valuations we downgraded the stock to accumulate mainly to reflect the, the recent share price movement but we maintain our target price uh, at about a 300 dollars this is mainly because our uh, revenue estimates remain unchanged whereas we slightly increased our patni by 1% mainly to reflect the high interest income so uh, overall uh, for a uh, sales force uh, despite the growth rate, the top line growth it has been uh, reducing but uh, the fox sales force we believe that margin expansion is, is still the main uh, uh, story uh, as over the last 6 or 7 quarter it has been focusing on in improving its profitability whereas uh, the demand for its co products it has remained resilient so uh, overall we uh, have a accurate recommendation on sales force so uh, that's all for me would now like to pass it on to say Thanks, Abhijit. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll talk about the technicals next. Uh, yeah. So first, I'm looking at S&P 500. Uh, last week we saw uh the index actually just move sideways. So for this week, we are likely to see this uh range con consolidation kind of continue uh going ahead with immediate resistance at five thousand six hundred fifty to five thousand seven hundred fifty area, while support could be at five thousand five hundred sixty to five thousand six hundred area. Uh, next slide. Now then for ETF money uh, update for August, uh, we titled it uh, US Treasury Bonds and Go to Extend Gains. So first start looking at how the different ETFs uh, for the different asset classes did in August. Uh, most were in the green. The top gainer was that of tracking Hang Seng Index, which was up 3.6%. The losers were ETFs tracking oil and Bitcoin, which were down over 4% and 10% respectively. Uh, in terms of the current trends, S&P 500, Go and Singapore equities are currently in the uptrend. Um, then for US Treasury bonds and Hang Seng Index are in the range consolidation, while oil and Bitcoin are in the downtrend. Uh, for our outlook for September, uh, we see that the price for US Treasury bonds and go uh could extend their gains. Uh, S and P five hundred, Singapore equities, and Hang Seng Index uh, could consolidate sideways, while oil and Bitcoin uh could continue uh its uh their downtrend with the recent uh with their recent bearish price action. Um, next slide. So first start looking at the S&P 500 ETF uh, view. Um, price, uh, there was a retest of a previous uh, resistance level close to $480 uh, at the start of August and a price uh, did a rebound afterwards, currently nearing a retest of the previous uh, all-time high, which is around $519. And so for this month, uh, could see some sideways price action as price could face some resistance upon the retest of this previous high. Yep. Uh, next slide. The next one is the Treasury Bond ETF IEF. So for IEF, um, it was up uh, slightly in August. Uh, price was re relatively sideways, but it continued to hold uh, previous resistance, um, which was around $96 level. So with that, uh, price could continue to move, to continue its uptrend upwards to test the next resistance level at around $99.65 uh, going forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, next one is the Go ETF uh, GLDM. So for Go uh, GLDM, uh, there was a breakout above the resistance at forty eight dollars twenty cents in August. Uh, breaking above the range consolidation, um, uh, resistance in blue. So it could continue its uptrend up uh, to test the trendline resistance closer to about fifty one dollars thirty cents. Uh, yeah. So we could see some uh, the uh, bullish momentum continue in September. Um, next slide. Uh, next one is the oil and gas um, ETF uh, XOP. So for this, uh, price action was relatively uh, still weak, um, uh, breaking down below the um, support level at around $141. Uh, there was a retest. It did a retest in uh, August, but it's slightly uh, to face some resistance. So we could see it continue its downtrend um, in September to retest the, the recent lows, which is about $128. Um, next slide. Next one for the Bitcoin ETF BITO. Um, price action relate remains relatively weak. Um, price is still uh facing resistance from retest of the trend support line breakdown, which was around twenty dollars, and also uh there was there was also a, a support breakdown level as well. So generally, price is trending in this uh, downtrend channel highlighted. So we could see some further pullback towards the support again closer to about sixteen to seventeen dollars uh in September. Um, next slide. The next one is for Singapore equity CTF ES3. So for this, um, 
price held retest of a of a the uptrend channel breakout in August and rebounded close to the to the highs around 350. So with that, we could see some uh, some consolidation hit from a there could be some resistance at this upon the retest of this recent high, quite similar to the S P 500 ETF as well. Um, next slide. The next one is the Hang Seng uh, ETF 2828. So for this uh, price uh, dipped towards the $60 level, which was a prior um, horizontal resistance level, and then found support rebounded. Uh, currently, it's doing a retest of the $65 level, which is a uh, previous uh, quite a uh, strong support level over there. Um, so over here, could see some resistance uh, acting, uh, where price could do some uh, sideways ahead. Um, next slide. Okay, next time we also have an update for Thai ICR Mali for August. So we titled it uh, Gulf Energy Development, Advanced Info Service and Delta Electronics to extend their gains. Uh, looking at their performance in August, uh, the SDRs had a, had a good month. Uh, most of them were in the green, except for PDT, which was down slightly about 0.7%. Uh, top gainers, there were a few. Uh, Gulf Energy was up 6.2%. Uh, Casicom Bank was up 8.7%. Advanced Info Service was up 7.7%. Yeah. And uh, for their current trends, uh, Gulf Energy, uh, Casicon Bank, Advanced Info Service, and Delta Electronics are in an uptrend. Uh, airports of Thailand, CPO, PTT are in a range consolidation, while Siam Simeon remains in a downtrend. And for our look for September, we expect uh, likely to see um, these strong gains continue, their gains, uh, continue to extend their gains uh, in September with the likes of uh, Gulf Energy. Advanced Info Service, PTT, and Delta Electronics likely to be in the green. Uh, for airports of Thailand, CPO, and Siam Cement could do some range consolidation, while Kasikwan Bank could do a slight pullback in the month ahead. Uh, next slide. Uh, for airports of Thailand, uh, price was relatively sideways uh, in August. So uh, with that, uh, price holding the, the support level around 56 to 57, but uh, we could see some audio sideways action ahead with near-term resistance at about 60, 60 to 61, but yeah, so we could see some consolidation. Um, next slide. Uh, for CPO price, um, still, still holding in this uh, bearish flat formation, uh, price rebounded from the support, uh, breaking above a uh, consolidation resistance around 58 baht. So that um, is nearing a retest of our previous high, around 61. So over here for the next month ahead, we could see some continuous sideways action ahead. Um, next slide. Uh, for PDT price, uh, continue find resistance upon a retest of a breakdown level, which was at uh, 145, 146 baht, uh, but also um, continue to just sideways upon a retest of a downwards resistance line breakout which was at around 141, 142. But so I think uh, we could see some slight rebound in the month ahead from this current support level. But uh, yeah, but could be a, a small rebound as there's still quite some resistance ahead, around 145 to 149 baht area. Um, next slide. Uh, next one for Gulf Energy Development. Uh, price action was strong. Uh, it broke uh, after breaking out the range consolidation resistance at $46. Price uh, did a retest and found support, and, and then uh, afterwards continue to break above the downtrend channel resistance. So with that, we like to see the price action uh, continue to remain strong, and price is likely to uh, go higher to test the next resistance with around 50, at the 52, 70, 54, 50 area uh, with this strong momentum. Uh, next slide. And for Kasikon Bank, uh, price price action was also strong. Um, it managed to break above the resistance around 135 baht a level, and then uh, we had, went on to retest the uh, a previous double top resistance around 146. So with uh with that um price could see some cons some slight pullback uh, consolidation uh this month, uh with some resistance at the current levels. Next slide. Uh, for Siam Cement, there was some recovery after a long. Uh, period of downtrend price uh, we tested a previous uh, support close to the um, 200, 200 baht level and then uh, there was some recovery back above 214 as well so um, currently it's testing about a resistance level around 230, 240 so over here we could see some some slight sideways um, 
price action hit in September as it consolidates uh, some of these rebound uh, main in August. Uh, next slide. Uh, for advanced info, service price action continues to remain strong. Um, after it broke out of the cup and handle formation, price continued to trend towards the trend line resistance and breaking above it. So I think we are likely to see, uh, we could see um, it continue to hit towards the projected target level of this cup and handle formation breakout, which is around uh, 270, but so currently price around 247. Now we could see the price continue to go upwards with the strong momentum. Um, next slide. And for Delta Electronics, uh, price uh, continued to move quite sideways, but end of the week, end of the month strong. Uh, still holding support at the previous uh swing high resistance around the ninety, um sorry around the ninety eight dollars uh level. So with that price, uh, likely you see some uh continue upside to test the pre a previous triple top area around hundred eighteen hundred uh hundred eighteen baht level. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, for Walt Disney, we have a technical buy uh, at $91.78, take profit levels at $96.50 and $100 respectively, stop loss at $88.30. Uh, last close was $90.38 on Friday. So for Walt Disney, uh, there was a breakout above a downwards resistance line uh, in blue. Also, price uh, did recovery above the $89.50 uh, support breakdown level. So with that, um, with the increasing momentum of MACD as well as bullish divergence in RSI, uh, we could see some um, bullish reversal price action taking place for price to rebound upwards towards these two uh, target levels with uh, prior um, support level breakdowns. Um, next slide. And to summarize the trade initially, that currently it's uh, down slightly about 1.5%. Yeah. So I'll hand over time to Paul to talk about, uh, to give an update about Silver Lake. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, th 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 thanks, Zin. Um, so I'll give an update on Silver Lake. Uh, it's covered by Glenn, but he's on reservice. So for for, for Silver Lake, they, they, there was two news. They announced their results. Then they, after there was a general take, uh, there was a takeover offer for uh, Silver Lake. So our recommendation is uh, to accept the cash offer. The last closing price before the takeover was 30 cents. Uh, so the offer, uh, we offer because it's uh, it's first it's above our target price and it's like three times above the the NAV, and the, secondly the results also wasn't that that great. It was below estimates. Uh, the unique part and bullet point number four, the unique part about this cash offer was that they are off. There's another uh, offer on the table which is thirty percent cash and one new renewable preference shares. So this renewable preference shares instead of Taking the six cents, you will get eighteen cents in five years. Yeah, it sounds amazing, but uh, so if you if you assume the Kega, you're talking about almost twenty five percent return per year over the next five years, and uh, this is not not this is not convertible. This is purely redeemable shares. That means, uh, thereafter immediately after five years, they will just pay you that eighteen cents. Uh, for us, I mean, we still recommend the cash offer, although it's not. Uh, because over five years it's just uh, unclear, and and frankly we're not even sure why why are they paying such a high high return. That one we're not not very clear. The in terms of the results, the results was below estimates. It was the revenue was fine, but I think the margins just collapsed. Huh? But the fourth quarter was I think the full year is only seventy percent of our results, huh? and considering this the third quarter, so the numbers were totally missed in the fourth quarter. Uh, the the one of the reasons why Silver Lake did poorly was because of their software license. So that is the highest margin part of the business. So that's where like all licensing you get like maybe a seventy to even eighty percent of margins. But the absence of software licensing, they actually uh, saw the earnings uh decline quite sharp, very sharply. Uh, move on to the next slide. The oh, sorry, the offer was actually done by the major shareholder. Uh, move on to q &M results. So q &M results for the first half, uh, what we, as the title suggests, the organic growth is starting to return. So the results uh, was within our expectations. Uh, if you notice, the earnings was strong. The earnings adjusted per me was up almost 50%. But if you dial back to first half 23, it's actually just recovering back to the 2022 type of numbers. Because huh? first half 23, also the earnings was down about 50%. So this is a recovery. 
uh, what we saw, the positive was the growth in revenue. Although if you look on the left, it's only 2%. But if you look at the core dental business, it was 4%. And if you take out the clinics, that means revenue per clinic, it was up almost 7% year on year. Uh, because if you notice at the bottom, they actually uh, the number of clinics actually declined by 3% or 3 clinics closed. And the other positive, although not written here, is the associates. You notice the associates, which is the listed housing q &M, there was a big swing from 200 million loss to a profit. So what has happened was two things. They did a lot of cost restructuring. Number two, the, the, the some consolidation in the industry. I think post-COVID, there were a few uh, dental clinics closed. In China, there are many dental hospitals and not so much dental clinics uh, because they are really huge, like hospital-like uh, dental chain, uh, two dental hospitals. And also the government has been uh, probably uh, incentivizing and giving subsidies on more complex places. Uh, so that's why our sin turned around, which is the associates. In terms of the negatives, the number of clinics declined. Uh, I think they are consolidating the clinics. If you recall, they were uh, expanding very aggressively 2021 to 2022. To, uh, to 2022, uh, thereafter, they, they started to consolidate to raise the profitability. We maintain our buy, no, no change our estimates. Uh, we think second half will still be resilient uh, because seasonally, our scene will be stronger. So the associates will, will be one part of the earnings growth. The rental, the revenue intensity in the dental procedures. So why the revenue rose? The ma management actually said because of their new uh, AI software, so this has been talked about for almost, I think officially launched end of last year, but they've been talking about this for almost two years. They're probably like two, three years in production. So what has happened is that, what happened is that a, a patient that goes in there, you will have a software that, that you will give the recommended procedure. So in a way, it's like unbiased procedure because it's not based on the dental doctor's view. And the second benefit is that there's some a lot of very good visuals that will help kind of convince the patients that this is the better procedure to take on. So they're beginning to see an uptick in revenue based using that particular software. Uh, the third one is, but the downside of having this developing a software is that it's going to cost money. So that was actually dragging down the earnings. So they actually sold 51% stake, so kind of, kind of uh, deconsolidate some of the losses. Uh, next slide. Uh, move on to Singtel Investor Day. So last Thursday, there was a in, uh, Singtel Investor Day. They do it once a year where all their associates and subsidies were present. In general, the, the, it was, uh, I mean, in general, it's in line. I think the, the, the major catalyst of, for Singtel, which I'll just run through, firstly, is the higher mobile prices. So there was increase in mobile prices, they, or they like to call it uh, mobile price repair in Australia, India, and Thailand. So these countries raise prices. Uh, we don't think second half they'll raise again. Most likely, you'll, but you'll see the margins coming into the second half. Uh, the second catalyst that, that, was, that we talked about was uh, uh, aggressive cost cuts. So they are remain, they are, they are, the management was really fix, uh, fixed on that. So the, the 200 million that they're going to take out from Optus and, and Singapore is on track. Uh, they're going to add on another 20% cut in their corporate cost, uh, which is about 150 million. This will take a few years, uh, maybe two to three years. And then they also mentioned that CAPEX has also peaked. Uh, so this will help improve the cash flows. Uh. Uh, for us, the most exciting division is digital infrastructure, which is basically data centers. Uh, just, they call it digital infrastructure because inside this division, there's submarine cables, there's satellite, uh, and yeah. And also data centers, of course. So the the we think this part has three major growth engines. So the data center capacity will tri triple to one hundred and sixty six megawatts. So the EBITDA or earnings will just double or triple. I mean, in line with capacity, because most of these data centers, especially those in Singapore, will be like fully taken up. The other interesting one is the new GPU as a service revenue, uh, uh streaming service. So. Basically, what, what GPU means is that uh, instead of the customer buying all these chips, they can, they or even relying on uh, on the hyperscalers. So now Singtel, in a way, is, is kind of becoming like a your hyperscaler and offering GPU as a service. So you can offer it either on three hours or, or even three years. You can sign a contract with them. And they got access to these chips because of their partnership with NVIDIA, especially the latest uh, Blackwell chips. So what, what this means is that it's a strategic importance because this will be a new revenue stream rather than you just co-location, which basically means 
you are just managing the the data centers for for other companies or you are just providing the the shell you know you're just providing the premise for hyperscalers so in a way it's also to reduce their reliance on hyperscalers so this is a, and this is a, and the the initially when we asked them before they were a bit hesitant to talk about it but i think now that they have better visibility of the demand so de demand from sorry to keep talking about this but demand for gpu as a service will come from sovereign so they're talking about Singapore, they're talking about Indo uh, Indonesia and also Thailand uh, using their uh, associates. Uh, the other one is Paragon. This one is, a is uh, I think it could be tens of millions of revenues. So this is a pure software business. So you're talking about margins of 80, 90%. So that is also beginning to grow uh, very strongly. And, uh, and that software basically is to help uh, corporate manage their network. Uh, and also cloud. So on one user interface, that means on one screen, you can virtually change cloud providers. You can ch change uh, software. You can change. You can you will, you will, you will monitor all your data centers. You monitor all your no, five G networks or even your intercompany land networks. Yeah, it's harder to explain this part, but anyway, this is also another high growth and it's a pure software business for them. Uh, the other two points is just the CEO CFO just mentioning that they are no change in their target and the other thing is they are still they are still on track to do the asset recycling which is basically selling things and then reinvesting to data centers uh, the associates for india the, the the key thing is that the competition they are uh, competition is healing and competition in india is not just higher prices they are going to do tiering because in india the prepaid prices is like or is one is there's only one price so they're going to do more tiering and maybe can help Raised Apu too. Uh, I won't, won't I won't run through every single thing because it's a bit long. But if there are any questions for Singapore, uh, for Optus, their subsidiary uh, is still cost cutting and also uh, higher prices. So they are benefiting from two sides. Uh. They, I think they cut their headcount by almost twelve percent, and they're gonna do another round of headcount cut, say four uh, percent the next two years. So for Singtel Singapore, which is basically their Singtel Mobile, this part, there's a bit of a negative uh, even for Starhub because uh, I would explain later, but there's a new license that they might take on and this might just incur costs. I'll talk about it later. Uh, I won't run through the, everything. Uh, can move on to the next slide. So I'll run through the usual weekly. So not much in Singapore, but for Korea, the August exports are still healthy. So it's still growing at a healthy pace. Uh, for the US, some signs of a weaker consumer because the vehicle sales is starting to fall for the last two months. And the more important core PCE, which is the usual fat gauge, it's 2.6 and slightly above uh, forecast. And it's trending towards the 2.5. Yeah, next slide. So for us, the REITs, so uh, the latest slides will show that the REITs was the big gainer for August. So for July and August, I think REITs were up around 10%, at least the index. So we think there's still room to rally. Uh, once we look into three to four more interest rate cuts in 2025. So we think there's still room for this re-rating to rally because uh, the REITs are still down 5% this year. For us, I think we are targeting more the higher beta reads. So we are looking at the overseas reads such as Cromwell, Elite, or even the deeply discounted Singapore ones like reads, uh, like OUE and Suntec, where their price to NAV is probably like, or their discount to book is probably 30 to 40%. One of the stocks, uh, of course, why we are suddenly talking about Hong Kong Land is because Hong Kong Land was the best performer among the large caps last month. But we still, maybe because of the cut in interest rates, but I think. Uh, the issues in Hong Kong, especially office, is still there. So the vacancy in Hong Kong office jumped three times uh, since the pandemic from 4 to 12%. And uh, the past six months alone, there was a very sharp jump in the vacancy rates. So 2% is huge uh, considering it. Uh, I think it probably took, can take like probably five, six years to even go vacancy so much. Uh. So all this was done in just six months. Uh, there might have been some buying because it's trading at 70% discount to book, which is actually no different to CDL. So on Singapore Telcos, I think uh, the 700 megawatts, so let me just dial, uh, just as a re uh, reminder. So in 2017, when the IMDA or the authorities was issuing uh, 
4G spectrum license. Um, so Starhub, Singtel, M1, the usual guys all bid for it. And Singtel had bid and just was 365 million. Starhub, 200 plus million. And I think M1 was 100 plus million. Uh, but they were not given the, the spectrum because the spectrum was, I think, shared or used for radio and some dis and also was also used by, I think, Indonesia or Malaysia. So the IMDA didn't give. But in the investment meeting, I think uh, the Singta did mention that there's a possibility they would turn this on by end of the year. So this is going to be negative for Starhub um, and even for Singta, all the telcos, are mainly, uh, but of course less for Singta because Singapore is only 25% of the, of the revenue. Uh, mainly because once you 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 once the government authorities give you this uh spectrum you have to pay so Singtel has to pay three hundred sixty five million, but there's no way you're gonna recoup any re uh revenue any man material revenue because the spectrum will just improve the bandwidth and I mean make more band bandwidth and I don't think Singapore is running out of bandwidth, so there's no, virtually just cost involved. Uh, likewise for Starhub, so the probably Starhub will be the most negative if once this is comes out. Uh, but. Yeah, the medium term is this could be a we think this could be an impetus for consolidation. Yeah, because both these telco Starhub and M one are going to be burdened by almost five hundred million of spectrum to be paid. So this will I guess only nudge them nearer to to, to they have to kind of merge and at least maybe share the burden of pain because otherwise if you don't have a consolidation there's no way you're gonna get any kind of meaningful payback. Yeah. So uh, move on to the events to watch. So in terms of events to watch, the key one will be US payrolls. So the expectations is 164,000. I think if payrolls drop below 100, then I think you should expect two rate cuts in the upcoming FOMC meeting, which I think is 17 September, if I'm not mistaken. But so, so this is a very important number. You depend, you will determine whether there's one cut or two rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. Uh, then the following week, we will have presentations by Hyphens Pharma, 17 Life. And also comfort they'll grow. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, okay, th this is just to show the some weakness in the uh, US consumer because their uh, vehicle sales, the red line is below the orange line for the last two months. Uh, the one on the right is just to show the inflation is trading below expectations. Um, so right now the red line is where the inflation, and if you extrapolate the shaded part on the right you probably hit 2.5 and this is below the Fed. So the Fed is expecting 2.8 if you look at the table in the middle. And it's already 2.6 now. So I mean, just another reason why the Fed will cut, which I think everybody already knows about. Yeah, this is just to reinforce it. Next slide. And okay, then this is just to show the difference between how Hong Kong office is performing against Singapore. So you look on the left, so these vacancy rates, of course going up is bad. Nah. So Actually, the vacancy rate in Singapore, CBD, and, and Hong Kong Central, probably more or less the same. I think it's it's probably around 6 to 7. But what, when the pandemic, post-pandemic, you will notice this big spike. Huh? So Singapore, the off vacancy is virtually full. I mean, like 5% vacancy. But if you look at, at Hong Kong Central, then the thing just spiked up. Huh? And that's why a lot of them, I think New World also announced they're going to make huge write-offs in their portfolio. The, the one on the right is just to reinforce it. I mean, not much difference. It's just the rents. So Singapore rents continue to grow slowly whilst Hong Kong is uh, trending down very sharply. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll move on to our usual model portfolio. So uh, the REITs did well for us. I think Cromwell, you owe you, but we were hit by all the small caps on China Vision, Electronics, and Capital Limited. Uh, the one on the right here is just against the STI. So the STI is up about 6.3. The model is up about 2.9, uh, excluding dividends. Uh, next slide. And this is just the performance by sector. So the, what has done well is, I think, healthcare, probably because of IHH. And the, all the REITs are up by 5%, 3%. Uh, on the one on the right, is just the, the top here is just the top 10 gainers and top 10 losers. So the losers were mainly a lot of the tech names like AEM, Nanoflame. And the gainers was mainly, uh, at the bottom are the large cap gainers, the index gainers. So Hong Kong Land was the biggest and sets. The weakest was Citrum, SIA, Yang Zhe Chang. Uh, just for reference. Okay, uh, next slide. This is just to show the big asset class. So the asset class that did well in August, the orange bar is REITs. Uh, so REITs were up almost 7%. Uh, finally outperforming the, the US 
the US names, uh, the weakest was commodities. Uh, uh, and the blue bar is the year to date, to August. Uh, next, uh, last slide. So the last slide is just to show you uh, by some of the, the, the local currency performers in Asia. So Southeast Asia is starting to jump again, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Thailand maybe because maybe they're optimistic on taxing, taxing nomics back again. And then the bottom is all the the North, North Asia and China, South Korea were the weak ones. And, uh, and the REITs again were the, the number three biggest gainer. Uh, but it's still down, I mean, 5% year to date. Okay, I, I think we can move on to Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, there was one question for me. So, Paul says, Salesforce, what does professional services cover and that have dipped by 6% for the second quarter of 2025? So, uh, professional services. Uh, this segment it basically uh, it, it basically includes the professional services or any uh, advisory services that the company provides to its customers, like basically help with uh, implementation or any training services that the company might have provided. So, basically, the the six percent drop uh, in the second quarter it's uh, it's still better as compared to ten fifth percent or fifteen percent in the previous quarters. And the drop, it's mainly because of like the delayed uh, delayed uh, uh, projects or any uh, uh, lesser demand for the, the the larger deals that the companies, uh, that the users, they might have delayed and deal size compressions. And uh, this has been impacted this particular segment. But uh, the professional services segment, basically, uh, 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 it basically represents just 6% of the total revenue. So it's a small part of its, uh, uh, that it's generated from the segment segment uh, there's another question with respect to what is the timeline for nvidia and crm targets so basically our uh, target prices uh, we have a time horizon of one year for our target prices so uh, hope that helps would now like to pass it on to the rest of my colleagues yeah thanks ambish uh, i'll take a few questions um, there's one here on dell's results so we do actually cover uh, dell but uh, essentially, uh, they issued better expected results. Um, uh, a, a lot of it is mainly due to to uh, some of the demand of AI in cloud, and so they are they are starting to see um, like, uh, uh, more demand on their server as well as networking revenues. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, essentially, that's basically their whole earnings, <laughs> uh, and this is actually boosting margins. So, so uh, it. Our view is that you know it's very positive for Dell. Um, I believe Oracle is coming up as well, so, and that should be good. Um, maybe a lot of these tech guys, a lot of the the the, the cloud providers, uh, infrastructure uh, they should benefit from this surge in, in AI demand that is going on for you. Uh, yeah, so hope, hopefully that helps. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't can't really say too much since we don't. Covered it. Uh, then there's another question here on Tesla news. Sorry. Views on new deliveries reported yesterday, competition to Tesla. Yeah, so news, I, I believe they delivered uh, over 20,000 vehicles for a you know, fourth straight quarter, if not wrong. Uh, but the, the difficulty is, is that Neo is not really a large player in terms of uh, just volume, uh, especially in China. I mean, the China is dominated by Tesla and um, BYD. Uh, and, and at the same time, their yeah, concept of uh, EV is also, also a bit different because you know they have the whole battery changing technology. So, so they are a bit different in terms of how they position themselves in the space. In terms of pricing, they are, they are roughly uh, in line with Tesla. So you could say they are com competing in the same price range, but the, the the vehicle and the, con the concept of the whole car is totally different uh, in itself. Uh, but overall, uh, I think we are still seeing quite weak numbers. I mean, Neo's deliveries and like 20,000 is it's not really that fantastic uh, in the grand scheme of things. There's a slight improvement, um, but it's, it's just a small day in the overall uh, industry. Uh, what, what we're still seeing is, is still pricing pressures, um, demand still lower than uh, where it was. Uh, a couple of years ago, and there's an oversupply of 
uh, um, uh, over capacity for production. So a lot of the uh, facilities, a lot of the production facilities are, are really very underutilized, and, and that's not really what, what you want to see from uh, from an industry perspective. Hope that helps to answer that. Um, yeah, I think that's all for me. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to the rest of my colleagues for now. Yeah, thanks, John. Mm. I'll take the question on what are your opinion on Gokulem results. Yeah, so Gokulem results um, is generally under most analyst expectations as well as consensus estimates because they had some lower fair value uh, gains as well as they recognize uh, about 100 million possible losses for their China development properties going forward because they gave um, quite significant discounts to get the sales running. Yeah, so so that was what, what happened for, for their main results. But the, the investment property side remains very strong because they have Goku Midtown. So Goku Midtown started contributing over the start of 2024 until now. So 2025, to have full contribution and as well as the retail side will start to contribute. So their investment property side will, will be strong. Yeah, and uh, but, but China remains weak as they have to give some uh, discounts for the sales to, to move. And for the residential in Singapore, the like Lentum Modern, Midtown Modern, Lentum Mansion, it has all been substantially sold. So during the full year 24 results, they also had some um, higher Pro, uh, revenue recognition for these properties or rather for these residential uh, projects yeah uh, yeah so uh, Goku Midtown also and, and Goku Tower has a high popular occupancy of uh, almost almost to like 90 more than 95 percent so yeah the investment property side is still the, the driver going forward oh, what are the best reads to buy Right now, um, yeah, so we favor those with high beta, like Paul mentioned, uh, like the uh, elite commercial and Cromwell. At the same time, they're also paying high dividend yield of almost 10% now since the share price ran already. So now it's now slightly lower, maybe about 9%. And uh, we also prefer those who are, those REITs who are trading at steep discounts to valuations, um, like price to NAV wise, like OUE REIT and Suntech REIT. So those two are, so, so, so those are our, our picks. Uh, yeah, one more question is, um, I think I uh, saw in news that SGX announcement of upcoming new IPOs on REITs. Um, any info on which sector's data? Yeah, so there's a pipeline. Um, I think the pipeline mostly is coming from um, data centers, hospital assets, as well as um, new economy, like logistic assets. Yeah. The, the fund flows will likely start to come in as interest rates come down as well. So. Yeah. Uh yeah, I think that's all for me. I'll hand over to my colleagues. Thanks. Um yeah, meow. Hi, I'll take the one seven life question. Yeah, so uh, one seven life mentioned that they have um returned to growth phase since second quarter twenty four, meaning its MAU has bottomed out, and there has uh this has been reflected in the second quarter twenty four operating income, which was three point five million, uh versus a negative two two point one million in first quarter twenty four, and we expect operating profit to continue to improve due to the ongoing cost cutting efforts such as the 12 million uh, saving from the R&D which has been uh which has already been done and will taken will be taken full effect in second half onwards and they are also streamlining um the revenue sharing parts in Taiwan uh which we expect uh, the full year operating margin in Taiwan will be improved by 5% and uh, something we would like to highlight is One Seven Life is in negotiating a uh, agreement for copyright for some like music copyright payment, which might impact the group's cash cash position. Yeah, but primarily this will affect the post operating income. Yeah, and will be viewed as a one off event. 
but this will like negatively impact their net income. Yeah, I hope it answers your question. And yeah, and there's a question for Seth. Is Seth's price running a bit ahead of itself? What's your year end target price? We are still pretty positive on Seth's. Uh, they have just renewed its contract with I SIA. We expect, because since SIA accounted for around like 17% of their uh, total income last year, so we expect around like 5% uh, increment um, the, of the after renewal. Yeah, so this will be one of the drivers uh, for uh, FY20, FY25 uh, revenue. And um, they're we are also pretty positive on their cargo outlook. The cargo volume increased by 19% year on year, and that is like very ahead of its uh, industrial average. IATA only uh, expect cargo volume to increase by 5%. Yeah, but with the um large market share of sets and also the synergy after uh, acquisition of WFS, we expect the number to hold uh, for the full year to FY25. And also um, their operating leverage has been significantly uh, reduced after uh, acquisition with WFS. Originally its uh, cost of financing was around 8% and now uh, it decreased to uh, around 4.5% for the all-in cost of financing. Uh, yeah, since it since their credit rating has been improved and they are committed to pay down around 200 million of the debt by this year. Yeah, that, that's all for me. Hope it answers your question. I will hand over to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will try to answer some of some of out of my depth because I don't really look at these companies. Um, your comments on IGH results, I haven't listened to their uh, earnings webinar, although it's actually open to everyone. But this is purely my conjecture on 99% guess. Uh, the results was, was was really good. I think they're growing like 30 plus percent. I think net profit almost 30-40%. So... Uh, what they managed to do, and they are going to grow their number of hospitals by 4,000 beds or 30 over percent. So, so I can only say, okay, so from a, a Singapore point of view, IHH, which is Glen Eagles, Parkway is, I wouldn't say monopoly, but you can consider them for very high-end, uh, complicated cases, specialist care. They are considered the a huge leader. I mean, uh, yeah, they they take the lead. I think most of that, most of it goes to them. So, it, it, so maybe uh, so foreign patients uh coming uh coming down may not actually impact them so much because they really take on the most complicated cases uh, compared to the other hosp private uh other hospitals. And they are also the three biggest markets for them. Singapore is the largest profit. Then second is Turkey, Europe. Then comes to to Malaysia. And Turkey is also doing well because Turkey all along has been, because of the currency, they have been able to secure uh, European uh, patients. So my my so my last comment will be, the, the challenge of a hospital is always to grow at the same time, open up Greenfield. Because Greenfield is always, com you're definitely loss making for the next two, three years. Somehow they managed to transition that. I think they managed to hit such a scale whereby even opening one or two new hospitals doesn't seem to impact the results. Uh, again, this is purely conjecture, 99% guesswork. So, and w once you get a momentum like this, I think usually it can run because they probably hit some scale whereby they're, they're hitting some operating leverage level. Yeah, uh, I think this is my own view. Yeah. I'm not sure it helps, but in, anyway, uh, but don't use this as a, proxy of uh, raffles uh. Uh, uh my own view i think uh they are singapore operations the parkway Glen eagles part i think is is very unique to them because they have a big stranglehold on complicated cases uh, compared to the rest which stocks are the best for growth uh, okay uh, u.s stocks obviously uh but for singapore the sectors that are Performing well would be some of these transport services, I guess, comfort sets, uh, marine sectors also perform well, and those construction and construction related, uh, just for Singapore, uh, very uh, loose. loose. I, I can, I mean, uh, John can add further, but of course, 
the big tech are the fastest growing stocks. I mean, their earnings are still like 30%, 40% kind of growth, and like NVIDIA and so forth, which is uh, multiple times more. Any new target price on the local banks with impending interest rate cut? Yeah, I, interest rate cuts in general would not be positive on their uh, results, especially net margins. Uh, the second point is uh, it could improve a bit on their price to book because when you do price to book, you have to take into account risk free rate. Uh, so net net, I don't think there's any meaningful impact. Uh, but my final point is I think the third quarter should should be the banks. My own guess is that the bank results should be strong because they are still hold on to their high net margins and they are guiding that interest margins will be strong because normally that interest margins drop when interest rates are down. But I think they managed to lock in a lot of uh, you know as as a bank you can put your money in loans or you can put it into uh, treasuries, into bonds. You know? I think they lock in a lot of the bonds at very long duration. So that's why interest rate cuts, they are not guiding any major drop in margins. And with, uh, and with in lower interest rates, the benefit is the wealth management will just grow because investors, instead of putting money in deposits, I guess if you have a if you're FA and you have a client, you will also, uh, most of the clients, because interest rates will become low, then they'll start putting into investment products, can be equities, unit trusts, whatever, and that will help their wealth management. And the final point is that I think in August in particular, you know, there was a huge volatility, as we can recall, the unwinding of the so-called uh, yen carry trade. That actually, FX volatility will help their trading business. So I, I think third quarter should be a strong quarter from the fee income. I think this is uh, what we think. I mean, of course, we there's never a direct read through, but it, uh, uh, but if you look at the environment, their fee income, trading income should be strong uh, uh, for the third quarter because of all the volatility. Uh, what's the outlook for TP or uh, Wilma on interest rate cut? I, I don't, we don't have any uh, uh, coverage on these three, but Interest rate cuts should benefit everyone. So I don't think it, there's a direct impact. It's very hard to isolate interest rate cut to the target price. Maybe to REITs, maybe, but for stocks, it's very hard. So if you take uh, Wilma, so maybe the interest rate savings might be, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 million. But at the same time, uh, they may need to grow the business and then need more need more borrowings or that. So, so it's very hard to compute uh, the direct impact. Uh, yeah on interest rate cuts to that. Yeah. But the beneficiaries of interest rate cuts is generally going to be REITs, which is easier, and all the real estate companies like, like Capital Land Investments and so forth. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, Mr. Tang here talking about uh, Tiong Boon. So uh, hi, Tiong Boon um, just released FI earnings with the highest revenue profit since 20. Any opinions? After years of strong cash flow low debt, will the management set a new dividend, pay more dividends? Will it be a good corporate insights webinar for Tiong Boon? Okay, uh, we can ask them. But yeah, that's why whenever we have a corporate insight, when, uh, it's important to have a huge audience um, so that then it will encourage the companies to do so. But we will, we will definitely invite, I will, uh, uh, we invited some, but some just ignore us. I don't have to, don't even reply. But anyway, we will always try. Uh, so we'll try and get Tiong Boon and there's another add value here. So we'll try and invite them if they want to do a, a corporate insights. Uh, and, and actually to get corporate insights, for a lot, of a lot of corporates like to do for funds, you know, but for retail, they always they are, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why, but they are very hesitant to do for retail. But I think for us, um, uh, we, we are very uh, fortunate that we got good attendees, attend, uh, you know, joining all our corporate insights. So thanks for everyone. Uh -huh. But we'll definitely put on these names and we, uh, we just send an email and ask them. Hi, Paul, is it better to buy Aussing or QM on market right now? Uh, our preference would be QM. I think Aussing. It's, it's still China. I mean, so uh, unless, we, uh, again, we, we don't have, uh, we have visibility, but we're not sure the valuations or that it still looks expensive because even though there's a turnaround, you're talking about profit of 500,000 to 1 or 2 million profit. Huh? And based on their market cap, I'm not sure, maybe it's probably 8 times, 10, 9 times. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure how, how the, is this a, is this a one or two year recovery for Aussie or is this a three to four year recovery? So that part, I'm not sure. But if it is, then of course, uh, Aussie is also another good bet. But for now, uh, we have more details on the QM and and then the, and it's larger. And QM valuations is about 15, 16 times 
uh, which is low, I mean, for a healthcare company. You know, most healthcare companies can treat into high 20s. So my thoughts is that if QNM can really do another year of strong organic growth and and their uh, software business, uh, lack of a better word, uh, start to sell outside of their dental chain, then I think uh, you can see a strong growth. Uh, I mean, the share price will then react now. I think right now the share price won't react because they just see this as a recovery from last year. But if I have to choose, I will prefer a QM. Uh, Paul, the Silver Link, the offer of combination and cash and preference share seem to indicate the 18 cents to be collected after five years is better than a one off 30, 6, 36 cents. Uh, uh, yes. Does this drive his share price higher than its offer price since the announcement? Uh, yes. Uh, I think, yeah, that's why I think the share price is trading at 38 cents instead of 36 because, but it's five years, you know, uh, yeah, so I think unless you really have good, good insights of, I don't know, communications to, to know the trajectory for the next five years, then uh, then I think those will come in and buy because you are basically locked up for, for five years. Yeah, so uh, again, there, there could be other arrangements which I'm not sure, but to pay 25%, I'm not sure how, how that is, is done. Yeah, but but it, but on paper, there's definitely a reason. I mean, you're talking about 18 cents in five years, so even if you split it by 10%, that means you assume you get 10% yield, you, so you're still getting like I, I mean, this is this just guessing, uh, just a guesstimate, maybe nine cents. So, you, on top, you're talking about 42 cents, even you buy a 42 cents, you can still get like a 10% return. Off that six cents that you're not getting, yeah. So, so basically, you're put you're you're paying uh ten cents and for uh because whoever comes in now you have to pay eight cents for the eighteen cents return over five years. Yeah, because if you buy thirty eight cents, sorry, it's very confusing now. But if you pay thirty say eight cents now, you're gonna collect thirty cents, uh back. So you are net net you're gonna have to. Your cost is eight cents, but you get eighteen cents in five years. So then you have to estimate what's the return over there. That's sorry, a bit confusing. I'll probably confuse myself. <laughs> Why is Silver Lake trading above takeover price of thirty six cents? Yeah, I think that's the same thing because if you buy Silver Lake now, you are net you're really footing in the difference between the share price thirty eight versus thirty cents, which is eight cents. Yeah. So uh, sorry everyone if I'm confusing them. <laughs> Hopefully I don't confuse myself. Uh, Paul, is SEMCOP upload good? The stock jumped last week. Uh, okay, so for us, SEMCOP is still uh, strong, but I think it's more a 2025 story. For, for SEMCOP, uh, if you look at dividends, uh, not, nothing really exciting. Uh, we are at 3% yield. So the main growth driver is going to be their renewables, uh, but most of the capacity is only going to come in in the later part of second half. So most of the earnings growth for SEMCOP Industries you're probably going to see only in, in 2025. So for me, uh, I think SEMCOP is more uh, 2025 uh, story than right now. And they also mentioned second half, the renewable seasonally is going to be weaker too. So um, that's why we don't think it, uh, the second half will be much of a much catalyst coming up. So yeah, that, that's my own view. What do you think of uh, so, uh, Mr. Ho CK? Uh, what do you think of Tiong Boon and Grand Banks with record high profit and low PE. Oh, yeah, okay. So for Grand Banks, uh, my own view, or I don't have met them recently, is it's just to understand whether the... Because when the pandemic happened, they got a lot of orders for yachts. Uh, again, I might be, I'm might i probably totally wrong. So uh, the thing is just whether... Is this just a one-off spurt? Because they, this is are based on orders that they secured in the pandemic or there's something new going on there's a new product lineup and suddenly everybody wants to start sailing or they have some product or they capture a new category because the Chinese aren't definitely not going to buy yachts so uh, their advantage of course I think they're building it out of Malaysia but it, it's just better a trend because when you're buying a order pipeline company it's always about the orders not, not so much about the results because by the time the earnings come in the cycle is already over so that is why I'm not sure whether Grand Banks, is this just a cycle because they got a lot of orders now? Of course, once you complete the order, then your earnings will be strong. Yeah. Uh, but but Tiong Moon will be interesting because uh, like we mentioned, next year would be you a very strong year for construction. I think when we talked about Penn United, you're going to get a huge number of contracts. Uh, you probably never seen it any better for next year for construction because you're going to get 
the two IRs combine, I think each 7 billion, you're talking about 14 billion of contracts will be coming out the next two years. Then you got Terminal 5, which is, I don't know, five, seven years. So next year will be a huge year for construction. Then thereafter, maybe it might start to taper down a bit, but it still be a very strong year. Yeah. Again, this is just my, my view. Yeah. Uh, recent reports are increased in rental in Hong Kong. Is this the reason for... I don't know. No, I'm not sure with 12%. I'm not sure how you're going to get a rental increase. I, 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 I'm I not sure. If it is, then it is fine. But hard to raise rent when you got 12% vacancy. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah, which is you have record vacancy and the vacancy just jumped the last six months. So I'm not sure. I, I really don't know how they're gonna get a rent increase. Uh for office. For retail is still fine. I think retail has been holding up better, but for office, I'm not sure. So what's your view on IX? So IX Biopharma. So for IX Biopharma, I think they are undergoing a, a major reset. So for IX Biopharma, Pharma, they had some products that were phase two uh, going to commercialize. But the problem is they, they actually did do, as promised, I mean, they did do have a licensing contract. and But the problem was the company that they, they licensed when the pandemic happened didn't really focus on their product, I think, and ended up burning, I think, 100 over million of cash and didn't, pro didn't develop their product as per the license. So they had to withdraw the license. And for me, I think IU by, IX by Pharma is... It's probably rewind back to square one. They have to do redevelopment again to commercialize some of the products. Uh, some of them is the opioids. No, uh, sorry, some of them is uh, not, not opioids, sorry, the GLP-1 drugs, which is the weight loss drugs. So instead of using or uh, deploying Ozempic, uh, which is the weight loss drug for diabetes using injections, I think they're going to try to use it through their, uh, their so-called uh, under the tongue uh, drug delivery system. So I think that's the latest for them. But I think generally, I think they have virtually had to dial back the la what they did the last few years. They just go back to square one again. I think, yeah, which is, yeah. Uh, what happened to SMI Vantage? Uh, sorry, I, I don't really follow uh, this company. I'm not sure what it is. So <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah. Will them will the Monte benefit from recast? Yeah, it, it, it will because. Uh, the one worry we have for Del Monte was the their in their gearing levels and interest debt. So they, they, they should benefit in this interest rate cut. Uh, what is your expectation for re okay, I'll, I'll leave it to to um to Darren. Uh, where's Peggy? So Peggy has left us, I think, two, three months uh, ago. Yeah. May I know what's the QR code and can I ask questions when your team not able to answer something due to time constraint, please? Yeah, we will try to answer as much as we can. Um, you can post it in our chat. Uh, it's a, uh, our our research chat. That's where we normally answer. But during the result season and so forth, uh, uh, that's where we are extremely we are busy on that. Yeah. Tiongmon results are recently low PE and trading a significant discount to dividend increase. Can research cover the stock? Any opinions? Uh, we can look. Uh, I think for construction, what we have done is we prefer to buy the, the building materials. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, because why we did building materials is because I think like I highlighted before, if the construction sector uh, rebound, then Penn United has like 40% market share and then BRC Asia has 70% market share. So we wanted to play it that way rather than try to find you know, who is the winner of what whichever projects. Uh, we just wanted to buy the the whole industry. Uh, I guess the sticks and shovels, I want lack a better word, rather than by individual uh, construction companies. Uh, because we know the, the construction sector, the cycle can be very sharp and very steep, but it's definitely an up cycle to the next one, two years. Uh, yeah. uh, can you give an update on Tassin? I will try my best uh, because this thing is like almost every week there's a piece of news, I guess. But what happened was that they have a new trustee manager, the new shareholder, which is I think the SOE, and thereafter, I think the previous management were trying to make some legal claims. But again, that's all I have to because I have to spend some time to go and study this thing because it's it's like watching some drama, yeah, some Korean drama kind of situation. I would rather watch Korean drama. Yeah. Uh, do you have a negative outlook on Starhub? Okay, so we are worried in the very near term because if they do, because if they have to, if the seven hundred megahertz is really issued by the IMDA. 
So even if they don't pay 200, uh, and they cannot sell this away because this is, was done by auction. So auction means you have to pay. Maybe they have they can pay at, uh, at the later stage and so forth because this thing was delayed. So the, there could be grounds by maybe the payments adjusted or maybe payment later because IMDA was supposed to give them this spectrum in 2017, but only like how many years? Seven years. So as a result, uh, but definitely it's going to be a negative uh, because you're going to have to pay for something that you may not really need, uh, uh, like additional bandwidth. I don't think most of us subscribers have any issue with bandwidth now, but uh, so I think you, you in, in, so in a nutshell, uh, having this spectrum will just incur costs. Uh, you will have a amortization cost, so you probably have another 20 million if they amortize over 10 years or 10 plus million impact on the earnings per year. Uh which, like I said, I don't think there's any revenue coming up from it. So we're negative in a very near term. Yeah. Grand Bank just released FI earnings. Any thoughts to share given the low debt, low PE? Uh, but good, will it be good if can do a corporate insects webinar? Okay, uh, okay I'm, I'm compiling here. I shall try. Uh, will, yeah. But hopefully they don't ignore us. So I, I, will, I have Tiong Woon add value in Grand Banks. Yeah, okay. I will try and reach out to them. Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah. What does Shana? I, 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 I no, no idea. Okay, uh, add value shows good possible turn around. Their order book sh shows steady growth. Could we do a proper insights? Yeah, okay. I will. No, I've already noted that down. Uh, what's your take on ISO team? I think my colleague Yik Ban has that was there, so I will. Yeah, uh, so Mr. Thomas is asking, Hi, Grand Banks, and just announced another strong results can cover. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. We, we noted Grand Banks very popular for Philip. Okay, yeah. Any update on Genting forecast? Uh, I, I no 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 particular up, update. The yeah, uh, but like I said, I, the probably could be one last who uh, one last rally. Then I think more one and done. I think maybe if the results, but I think everyone just knows that the tourism numbers is coming down. So, uh, is there could be just one last shot rally because after the big. One more bump in the second half of this year, where the Chinese tourist numbers will come back, then I think twenty twenty five is going to be very uh, will be a ready week for Genting, and thereafter they have to spend all these capex, uh, the four billion capex that they have to spend on the on the, on expanding the rooms and other facilities. Are uh, just off the top, I, mean, I I don't have it. Yeah. Okay, I will I I will leave it to the rest first. Yeah, uh, for Darren and Yikban and the rest. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for yeah. Anything on Parkway Life Week? Yeah, so for Parkway Life Week, there's no doubt that their assets are solid, like Singapore hospitals, certain nursing homes, and, and such. So as a result, the market is also pricing the fact that their assets are uh very resilient, like Singapore assets, which is also why they are probably trading at like one point six times price of NAV, and at the same time, their dividend yield is also at four percent or even lower than four percent now. So. Just based on these factors, it doesn't really seem attractive, even though their assets are, are solid. But um, the thing about Parkway Life Fit is for the Singapore portfolio, there's a rental kicker in 2026 where they will get about 25% more rents for their Singapore portfolio. So by then, um, the, the dividends or DPU will, will likely increase. But until then, um, at this share price, you can expect about a 4% dividend yield going forward, which we do not think is attractive in this current market. Yeah, so, so that's my view on Parkway Life 3. Uh, what is the expectation for REITs for Fed rate cut for 25 or 50 uh, basis points and if over the two rate cut? Yeah, so um, if you're uh, from the first, talking from the perspective of share price, um, our expectations is that, of course, with 50 basis points, we think REITs will <coughs> perform better, but we think a lot of the interest rate cuts, like the, the market has already priced in like three at least. So even if the Fed does cut like 25 basis points in September, the share price might not move as much because it's no surprise there. Yeah, but if the Fed does not cut or, or in any unforeseen circumstances where there's a U-turn, then of course, we, we think the rich share price will crash again. So that's the perspective of um, the share price. But for uh, interest savings, we think um, any possible savings will likely come only in 2025 as some of the hedges fall off and as the, the REITs they reprice their, their, their um, 
uh, or rather as they refinance their loans. So interest rate savings will likely come only next year. Yeah, so so that is our take, but right now we are we are overweight for REITs. Um, as Cromwell REIT continues to divest non-core assets, its TP will continue to drop moving forward. Why have you selected this REIT as a focus REIT? What is the meaning of high beta? Yeah, okay, so first of all, uh, Cromwell REIT, they will continue to divest as part of their strategy, but um, from the previous half, they've already mentioned that because of their stability in gearing at around 40%, they do not see, and as well as the fact that their portfolio valuations have really started to increase already, like based on like when interest rates kept rising over the past two years, cap rates kept expanding. But I mean, the half year valuation, we saw that their valuations managed to increase. So the, the breaching of their gearing based on the devaluation of um, investment property is unlikely going forward. So as a result, they have also, Cromwell has also decided to uh, lessen their, or rather decrease their divestment pipeline from about 150 million to about 90 million as of the most uh, recent quarter. Yeah, so number one, they'll divest less assets. DPU, we've already uh, forecasted it, it to drop going forward into our, our forecast and our model. And despite um, the absence of contribution from all these divested properties, we see a DPU of about 13 plus cents. So uh, 13 plus cents, it translates to, to about a 9% dividend yield going forward. So we think at this 9%, Dividend yield, despite accounting for all these divestment trading, is still, uh, is still very attractive. As we, and next is what's the meaning of high beta stock. So beta is basically a risk measure uh, compared to market risk. So, um, a high beta is um a higher volatility stock where, um, like the returns is, uh, more than the market. Basically, basically it moves more. It's more volatile than the market for beta more than one. So a beta more than one is considered a high beta stock as well. Yeah, so um, we, we've seen Cromwell and some of the overseas listed REITs, their share price volatility is also more than the market, which is why they are, uh, which is the meaning of high beta basically. Yeah. Um, this first read on YouTube, Please provide link. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but if you mean the whether the corporate insights webinar we did with first read last week or two weeks ago, can't remember when exactly. Um, it's on YouTube. Uh, no, we did not record, and we usually do not um update our corporate insights webinar or upload our corporate insights webinar on YouTube, so we do not have the link. But uh, oh, sorry, a question jump. Uh, yeah, but for the question is, what is your overview and TP? Yeah, so for first read, we have a buy call and our TP is 30 cents. For the overview of first reads, they are, basically their assets still remain very resilient, especially with the Indonesian assets. They have a long lease. And over time, um, the contribution from LiPo will also decrease. So LiPo is considered the higher risk tenant as to, uh, for LiPo uh, developer and their cash flows are more lumpy as compared to Siluam. So over time, Siluam's contribution will start to increase. And that is a more like a, like a stronger tenant with stronger cash flow, so that the, the risk is lower. As well, they are also backed by a 4.5 minimum escalation for their Indonesian portfolio, which accounts for more than 80%. So that is also will we'll start to increase the DPU over time. And it can also offset or partially offset some of the FX headwinds from the weak rupiah. But we've seen the rupiah um, appreciate a little bit from its lows in a few months back. So yeah, that's a that's a good sign in, in the near term, I guess, for first read. Yeah, and first read um is also paying a dividend of upwards of nine percent, almost ten percent at the current price. So we also think that is attractive. Uh yeah, I think that's all. I hand over to Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Uh, I'll take the question on uh ISO team. So you asked what's our take on ISO team's results. Um, our company don't. I mean, our team don't cover uh ISO team. So uh, I'll just um 
brief on my opinions on this company. So I went for their analyst briefing and they did, they performed quite well uh, year on year. Revenue was up um, 18% and gross profit margin was also uh, up 15% year on year. And 15% is back at their pre-COVID levels. So um, it has good signs in both uh, profit and revenue. And I believe that this will, they also continue this uptrend because uh, management provided target that the next five years target for gross profit margins will be 15 to 20%. And, um, and this is a company that has 55% of their demand on from the public sector because they do a lot of uh, A and A and R, R and R on the construction side. A and A is the additions and alterations and R and R is the repair and renovations. Uh. So whenever there's a lot of public projects, they will have to take on these projects. And um, so I believe that the drivers will come from at the SG Green Plan 2030, where they, they want to increase the parks land area by 50% from 2020. So with the increase in parks, there will be a lot of maintenance needed on like, for example, the tree pruning, and also as what uh, Paul mentioned just now, uh, construction will likely do well next year because of the big BTO projects and all the IR and Terminal 5. So um, this is where I believe, uh, but this is just my personal take that um, the company will continue to do well. Yeah, uh, hand over to my colleagues. Uh, yeah, there's one more for me. Capital D series issued 2.1 million units recently released value earnings. Uh, yeah, so the units issued uh, uh, mainly basically you can say is the usual cost of business because the units issued were um, management fees basically from some of their uh, payment from managing uh, like the capital D series assets in Singapore and overseas as well, as well as the divestment fees and acquisition fees in respect of the divestment of the Intelli Center campus and the acquisition of Tokyo Data Center. So um yeah, it will basically dilute, but it's um not, not that bad because I'll say is if even if they don't issue in um in the longer term it will dilute, but um instead of paying cash upfront in the current in, in the current financial year, they, they're just issuing units. So basically you can say it will dilute in the longer term, but actually not much different in impact yeah yeah that, that's my take yeah because it's after all it's part of the normal cost of business that um a lot of the investment fees and acquisition fees are it's, it's quite a normal thing that uh, is paid in units as well yeah i hope that explains it thanks um maybe i'll hand over to or zing yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Darren. Yeah, I'll start on the TA. Uh, and so the first question is on uh Singtel. I think Singtel is uh is still a strong uh uptrend over here. Recently, price uh there was a break above uh three dollars and uh yeah currently it's around three dollars and nine cents. So I think with that uh yeah we just we well, still see the price uh, to trend upwards. The next resistance is likely around three twenty. Um, the next question is on China Aviation Oil. For China Aviation Oil, I think uh, overall it's still in the consolidation. We still see support around the 84 cents, 85 cents area. Um, resistance is still in this downtrend, downwards resistance line as well. So I think near term wise, we are still see some sideways between like 85 cents to currently um, 87 to 88 cents resistance. Um, the next one is on uh, Bank of China. Okay, for Bank of China, I think uh, quite sideways as well. Uh, price is finding some resistance from this normal resistance line as well as this horizontal level around three around 360. Uh, currently, some support will be around uh, this level around 347 where price previously broke up from over here. Yeah, so upon the retest, I think I like, see some support come in um, or probably some sideways for the time being um, around with some resistance around 360 there. Okay, then there's a question on the uh, DA view on the three local banks. So first up, uh, DBS, I think uh, 
that is managed to break upwards from this uh, consolidation uh, between uh, 3540 to about 3620. So that way, uh, price today tested this previous uh, this double top uh, breakdown level around 3670. So I think with that, uh, if you can continue to move upwards, I think next level will be closer to about 37, uh, 3750 to about 38 about here. Upwards momentum since uh, breaking out of this, uh, uh, this range consolidation over here. Okay, next one is on uh, OCBC. Okay, so for OCBC, um, also similar uh, price range to break above this consolidation around uh, 1450. Uh, currently, I think we are likely to see a retest of this next resistance level at 1470. Then uh, with, that, with the recent this um, momentum with the, with the breakout of this consolidation, we could see the price towards uh, the retest of 1490 this high as well. Then for you will be um also currently similar as well. Uh price also trending upwards since uh breaking about the consolidation over here around 31. Uh we could see the price test the next resistance around 3180 to about $32 area. Okay, then next one is uh, uh next one is uh, AMD. So for AMD, uh, I think some price weakness currently uh, with price, uh, there was some sideways, but price wasn't able to hold this 152 level, which was this previous high, uh, previous swing high over here and then broke down. Currently it looks a bit sideways. So I think, yeah, we could see some consolidation at the time being some with some support coming in around 145. Uh, next support level downwards is around 141. Yeah, so for now, maybe some sideways. Um, then for... Nvidia. Yeah, Nvidia after the um after the earnings there were, previous before the earnings there was a consolidation taking place between 123 to 130 over here. But afterwards there was some there was this uh this um uh, gap down afterwards. Price is still holding at a, a support level 118, which is which was this previous swing high over here. So uh if can hold over here, I think I will expect some some sideways uh with resistance currently at 123. But if there's a breakdown that takes place of these 118, uh, price could see further uh, downwards momentum towards the uh, next support level, which is probably around 111 to 112. Um, yeah, it's the next support. Okay, then for Intel, current looks like uh, still in the range over here, but on Friday, uh, the price will be tested the resistance of 2180. So if you can break above it, I think we could see some price recovery um, towards the next resistance around 2460. Okay, then for Samsung, okay, Samsung. Um I think it's quite range bound for now. Uh key support is still around the 71,000, around 71,000 level over here. Um yeah, then recently the facing some resistance on close to 80,000 after this uh, this sell over here and retest of price support. So I think for now probably it's still a bit of a downward momentum. And yeah, we could see maybe price go down a little bit further to retest the support again. Um close to this 71,000, 72,000 support level. Okay, then there's a question on silver lake QM and comfort that will group. For Silver Lake, yeah, after the the offer, um, it's just hanging sideways, same round sideways, um, yeah, around thirty seven cents, thirty eight cents over here. So I think nothing too much. Probably gonna just sideways over here. And for Q and M, now Q and M also is quite sideways. Um, 
still uh good thing is still holding above this previous range resistance at 25 and a half cents. So probably we, we might see some price uh, consolidate in this range between like 26 and a half cents to the resistance around 29 cents. And then for comfort they'll grow, I think price um it probably sideways as well. Uh managed to overcome this 138 resistance now turning as a support, but we've also there's also some near to resistance close to 142, 143. So with that, I think I'll expect I will expect some sideways consolidation of timing. Okay, next question is on AT&T. Okay, AT&T, I think it's, uh, it's like an ascending triangle because it's holding this upward support line. Uh, resistance is around $20. So for now, uh, we might still see some slight consolidation. Uh, then if there's a breakout of that, uh, then press to head towards the next resistance level, which is uh, 20, around $20.60 as the next level. Okay, so next question is for T-Mobile. E-mobile, I think it's still a, a, a strong uptrend of your price uh, still trading above this previous uptrend channel. Um, yeah, so for now it looks like some slight pullback taking place, but we've likely to find support from retest of prior resistance breakout, which is around this 196, 197 area. So, so if you see a bounce ahead, um, then maybe we test a recent highs around 203 to 204. For Dell, I think Dell it's quite sideways. Uh, after results, was this gap up over here to and then just help in the we have uh, this doji over here with, um to retest this resistance at one hundred sixteen. So I think for now, let's see whether it can break above this high of Friday. Then it could hit higher to retest some higher resistance levels like one hundred twenty two and then one hundred twenty eight. Thanks after this uh, consolidation phase. Okay, for HP, um, our price is quite range bound for the time being. Uh, support is coming in around 30, 3450. Some resistance for now is around 3620 to 37. So I think for now, it still looks like some uh, range bound price action for the time being. The next one is a uh, capo. Okay, so for capo, it looks a bit uh looks a bit sideways for the time being. Uh, some resistance coming in around the six twenty level, which was this prior swing low. Uh, then price did some pullback to then uh yeah, it looks like some range bound going on with support around uh, around six dollar mark. So probably some consolidation for the time being. We never capital DC read. I think uh overall still trending upwards uh quite well in this uptrend channel. Uh recent price action is quite sideways holding above this previous resistance. So at around two two dollars eighty cents. So uh, still looking good. I think um current resistance will likely be uh, around two twenty probably is the next resistance for the time being. Okay, for ST Electronics, for ST um, Engineering, uh, ST Engineering, I think for the for, for now, it uh, looks like some sideways trading going on, but price is still holding the previous resistance at around 443. So still looking good. Uh, we might see some sideways currently over here then. Uh, key resistance around 458. And then for Valetronics, uh, looks like waste as well. Uh, price just holding at support around 59 cents. Uh, some resistance on 60.5, 60 and a half cents to 61 and a half cents level. So yeah, I think probably quite sideways for the time being also. Okay, 
Okay, then for OUE read, um, looks like price are uh, doing some consolidation for the time being. Overall, um, there was a, after the break of this downwards resistance line as well as this prior range consolidation resistance at twenty seven cents price, uh, managed to trend higher. So it looks like some consolidation of uh, resistance at twenty nine cents for the time being. Uh, then uh, if you can break above it, the next key resistance will come around thirty one cents area because this previous double, um, double top over here. Okay, for Pfizer, um, some range consolidation of timing. So for I think for, uh, it needs to see a break up of uh, twenty nine twenty resistance over here. Then price could uh hit to could pass a higher resistance level like higher resistance levels like uh twenty nine eighty to thirty dollars thirty cents. Uh, for now, it looks like some range, uh, still taking place. For Moderna, um, some slight, still some weakness. Uh, price is still doing a doing a retest of this seventy nine dollars support and just um, heading lower still. So yeah, look from price action still looks pretty weak. So it was a break below this eighty five dollars level where we tried to break above from. So with that, uh, I think we could still see price head lower towards, uh, the, some lower supports like um uh, seventy three dollars next. Then for um Johnson and Johnson, um for this is currently doing a, a test of this downwards resistance line at around $166. So I think there might be some resistance over here. Price could just uh, consolidate for a while. Yeah, but if there's if you can break above it, next resistance to look at will be around close to 170 area. Okay, for Bank of America, I think for now, uh, looks like it's uh could hit uh higher uh, with this with a uh, recent consolidation over here. Uh, Friday price broke above forty dollars, uh, around forty dollars twenty cents over here. So next resistance could hit towards is around forty one forty, then followed by forty two dollars this for uh Bank of America. Okay, then for CD group, uh, still looks quite sideways. Um, some near term resistance likely to still hold around sixty three. So I would expect some consolidation to, um, take place, uh, still for the time being. Okay, for Wells Fargo, um, yeah, section is still quite good since uh we test of this resistance fifty six dollars price. Still holding above it, so I would expect some price to some near term upside still, or price will retest the uh, higher resistance levels. Like, uh, for now, there's some resistance around 58.50. Uh, the next resistance level is around 60 dollars 40 for Wells Fargo. Okay, then JP Morgan, uh, I think for now it's still. Uh, since breaking above two hundred and seventy dollars, is uh, still making new all time highs. So it looks like we still likely see this uh moment, this momentum going strong ahead. Okay, for US Bank Corp, um, now price may should break above this resistance at forty five eighty. So with that, I think we still like to see some upside ahead. Uh. Next resistance will probably come for around forty seven, around forty seven eighty to forty eight dollars. Uh, yeah, which was a previous swing high back June twenty twenty two. Okay, for bank of, uh, BMY Melon. So for this, uh, 
it was a break above the resistance 65, 65.50. So with that also, I think we'll like see this momentum continue upwards as well. Yeah, with this fresh breakout. Okay, then next up is uh, Samcom Industries. Okay, so Samcom, I think uh, chart is looking better. Um, break up, there was a breakout above the in this inverse head and shoulders resistance at around 4, 480. So I think with that, price is likely to hit higher in the near term. Uh, as long as this this uh this level holds, uh next resistance level is around five dollars, then followed by followed by I think it's around five fifteen, yeah, five fifteen and five twenty five. Okay, then for IFAS, I think for now still looks like some uh looks like some weakness. Uh it bro after breaking down this ascending triangle, price a retest. Uh, but finding resistance from after finding resistance at around 735, this previous horizontal breakdown as well. Uh then just continue to trend a bit lower. Uh yeah, for now I think it's probably side either some sideways or it could go lower as well. Yeah. So the next support level, next key support level is around 680. Again, this swing low over here. Okay, for Bausti, I think for now, still carrying on this range consolidation with resistance here acting at $1.01. $1 .01. Uh, then let's see whether it can break above it, then the next resistance level will come around $1.03 for policy. Okay, for Aztec, I think uh, Aztec is looking better. Uh, after range consolidation over here, uh, break above the resistance at 96 cents. Now it is testing next resistance at around 90. Um, 98 and a half cents. Then afterwards, the next one is around one dollar and two cents. Yeah, so we might see some uh slight consolidation next, and then uh it could hit higher if it falls above the 96, 97 cents if you careful. Okay, for Franken, I think price. For now, it's, and there's still some weakness. Um, yeah, since the consolidation over here, if it broke below this 134, 135 area, we tested the next support at 125, 126 over here. So probably some sideways for the time being, but I think resistance is probably gonna come in around 131 to 133 over here for the time being. There's also like a this downwards resistance line as well. Okay, for Palantir, there yeah, are some pullback, uh, some pullback from this uh, channel, main channel resistance around $33. Uh, but we expect support to come in from this, this previous uh, breakout level around 30, to it, around $29.80 to $30 about there. So probably some sideways consolidation for the, for the time being. Yeah, then for TSM, uh, I think still still doing some range consolidation currently between one sixty six to one seventy six about there. So, um, uh, so you see which direction does it will it hit towards next? If there's a break above one seventy six, then likely uh, go towards one eighty three. Um, this to test this uh previous breakdown the level. Uh, but then if there's a break downwards, then next we'll probably test the next support level around 160. Okay, for ARM, I think it's uh, currently still sideways as well between uh, this 123 to around 136. So we need to see uh, if there's a break above 136, it will probably hit test the next resistance at 145. Uh, if there's a breakdown below that, uh, below 123, will probably come down towards uh, close to 1 
10, 1, 12. Okay, then some Hong Kong counters first up is uh Baidu. Um Baidu for the time being, I think it's still uh going on some range consolidation prices. Uh did a test of the support recently around uh close to 79 to 80 is still holding. So I think for now near term resistance levels will be it is 85, then followed by 88 over here. Still looks like a range over here too. Okay, then for Alibaba. Alibaba, um, some some step away after we testing this blue um our resistance line at 8384. Um, I will expect this support at this previous resistance at 78 to hold as a support. Uh then probably some sideways over here first, uh, between 78 to 80 84. And then for JD, um, yeah, JD also range one for the time being still. Uh, I think support is still likely to hold this. Uh, this level is your 99, over here. Um, then resistance will come in at hundred and seven hundred is the first level over here. And next up is around um, hundred and thirteen. So probably still some range one for the time being between, um, hundred to about hundred and eight over here. Then for Ping An insurance, the uh, yeah, chart is a uh, turning upwards uh, over here, but uh, yeah, still finding resistance from these prior levels, which is currently there's some reason on thirty eight over here, which yeah, is doing some slight pullback over here, but I always expect support to pull at thirty six for for now. So probably some sideways again. And then there's a question on what's podium state or CFMAC, QAF, IC, and STEC. Can do a TA on it. Um, CFMAC. Okay, CFMAC, I think for now, uh, it broke above, it broke out a slight consolidation of resistance on 95 and half cents for now. But I'll expect some resistance to come in 96 and half cents over here. So probably some sideways over here between. 91 and to 96 and half cents for the time being. Then Q8 F. On oh, QF, I think it looks rather range, range bound. So currently it has been consolidating for a long time between 80 cents to 82, 82 and a half cents here. So it looks like it will still continue this trend for the time being. Okay, then ISTN. Okay, for SDN, uh, it's still downwards trending. Uh, over here, yeah, just um also broke below a range consolidation support of three nine cents over here. Price is just trending lower. So for now, uh, probably some sideways or continue the downwards trend. Uh, first support level twenty six cents. Next one is around twenty four cents. Okay, then what's the what's my view of food empire share price has dropped from 140 to 96 and a half cents okay for food empire i think yeah uh there's still some weakness in the stock um price is still in probably in this descending triangle currently with um the key the support is on 95 cents over here but price is still forming lower highs and then also there's also quite a lot of resistance from one dollars over here um this which was this uh, this area yeah, so I expect um likely still some consolidation with lower highs in it.
Okay, then there's a question on Thai Bev. Uh, I think Thai Bev is uh chart is looking better. Um, trying to break above this resist this long time resistance of eighty two cents over here. So if you can hold, we might see some upside ahead. Um, current resistance around for fifty four cents as well as uh fifty seven cents for Thai Bev. Okay, then for nano film, um, nano film I think is probably doing a range for the time being. Uh, price is yeah, there was a tight range going on at around seventy four cents, seventy five cents. Today there was a today price tried to go higher with some volume. Uh, yeah, so it can sustain above. You can sustain above the opening price around uh seventy five cents. It could test this swing high around seventy eight, seventy nine cents. Over here, then you might do yeah, a consolidation again. Okay, for Olam, I think overall it's in their this range consolidation one dollar and six to one dollars and eighteen cents, but uh, lower uh shorter time frame is in the tight range over here, uh one ten to about. 115. So probably still some range consolidation going on, I think. Okay, then there's a question on Baker Hughes. I mean, for Baker Hughes, the uh, price, you know, since uh, breaking below this prior, this previous resistance on 36, uh, this has turned into a resistance. Uh, price is consolidating between 34 to 36. So it looks like it, looks like it's still probably going to do some sideways over here from, from now. Uh, if there's a break below 34, then price might go lower towards the next support, uh, which was this previous horizontal resistance at 33. Next one is on IEP, which is Icon Enterprises. Yeah, for this uh, counter there, there was a breakdown below this 1470 last Monday. Uh, price then price went on down to retest this support around 1280. So yeah, for now we might see some um, consolidation take place. Near term resistance around 1380 level. And SPLK is a Starbuck Terrier's Corp. Yeah, for this it looks like some consolidation taking place currently. Um, Yeah, we also need some near term resistance as well from, from this horizontal level at 20, 2180. So, probably still some consolidation likely still to take place. Then, CMPT is Euro NEF. Okay, for this, it looks like uh, consolidation taking place as well. Key support uh, is around $16. Uh, for now, resist some resistance will be from this recent breakdown over here at $16.80, then followed by a higher resistance level around $17.30. Yeah, but for now, I think it looks like some, probably some consolidation between $16 to $16.80 for a time being. Okay, then CV, um, 
Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. not sure which counter you are referring to. Maybe you can reply in the chat. Thanks. Then Asian Pay TV. Okay, for Asian Pay TV, um, yeah, still looks. No. It looks like some range one going on, but um, it's like chart is looking slightly better. Uh, price recovering above this, this breakdown at zero point zero seven nine zero point zero eight. So um, so with that, could head to test this next resistance area over here, which is from um zero point zero eight four to zero point zero eight six. Yeah, then likelihood then likely is that uh probably sideways again afterwards. Then next one is uh, from or uh, if or from well. Okay, oh, Cromwell, I think uh yeah, since price broke above this resistance over here around 130, 135 to 138 area plus. Uh, move upwards. We'll like to see a retest of this swing high 148. Again, then uh, and afterwards, you could see some consolidation take place afterwards again. I think that's all the key questions. Uh, I'll give uh, the time to my other colleagues for the other questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me just try to answer some, then we can wrap it up. So some of these are really, what happened to SMI Vantage? I think they were on some watch list, and so when they got suspended, <laughs> frankly, I'm not sure. Maybe they couldn't meet the the watch list and delisting no notification. So that's why the suspension, it most likely it could be delisted. Yeah. What does Shania do? So Shania, a very small company, I'm just looking at it. The revenue is only 7 million, so they do waste collection. For cruise ships, yeah, and for industries, I think, yeah. But revenue is only seven million, yeah. Uh, any opinions on Bowsip? Yeah, but Bowsip is still waiting to get a response from them if we could meet them. But they are actually doing really well. I think the earnings I don't know up forty percent. Of course, there was some small one-off gains and interest income was like one third of the earnings, but it's they're performing well. Uh, across all their divisions but I need to meet up with them to get better understanding because they don't do any presentations or anything what's the stock recommendation on SGX for growth in Malaysia so for growth in Malaysia and Indonesia ultimately it's better to just get a direct exposure rather than buying it through Singapore likewise if you want to buy a, a recovery in China you know, better to buy it directly from China but if you want to know for, for, for Indonesia, probably Jardin Cycle and Carriage, because Jardin Cycle Carriage is uh, most of the earnings come from Astra International, which is the largest, uh, which is the largest motor vehicle distributor. They also own United Tractors. So that is one way. And you can also buy plant, plantation companies if you want to get to Australia, uh, Indonesia. Indirectly, you can also do it through Vilma, but that's really indirect. Uh, and for Malaysia, the most direct play, probably if you want rubber gloves, if you reverse stone, uh, consumer could be FNN Limited Singapore. But again, you can always just buy it directly from Malaysia. Or IHH, even IHH, it's better to just buy it from Busa, Malaysia. Of course, you can use it through, you can use the points that come to do it. But if, for pure play, it's really better to go direct. I mean, our own view, because the liquidity is better. And... And if uh and investors are excited about Indonesia, then they will allocate more weights and funds or money into Indonesia, and you won't see the impact through um through Singapore, uh, of uh, Indonesia like for instance Indonesia there's also Sinamas land I think it went up but most of their earnings or value maybe seventy eighty percent of it comes from Bumi Sapong, which is their Indonesian listed arm, it, yeah. So if that doesn't move, I think frankly, no, no point buying Sinamas land. Yeah. And most of the liquidity and everything, the value is all at Sinama, uh, at Bumi Sapong itself rather than buying it through Sinamas land. So you want to capture the, the short-term liquidity and the long-term upside is better to go direct. Uh, any opinions on capital infrastructure trust? 
they're doing a rights issue. Uh, uh, sorry, they're doing a, a place placement at I think four three eight or forty four cents. So it's going to be negative for the stock because it will cause an overhang. Overhang. You know, usually when you have a placement, uh, people have the shares now cheaper. I think the share price now is forty six cents if I'm not mistaken. And and many investors are having the cheaper cost of 44. Obviously, they're going to sell it. Uh, although, uh, usually the fund managers will say they're long-term, but if there's a big discount, they just dump it. Uh. So, that's the risk. And I think this placement is also dilutive. Uh, and it will bring down the yield from 8 to, I think, 7% uh, dividend yield. Yeah. Any updates on venture? So, for venture, the one that can really move the needle... You know, usually venture doesn't really tell who their customers or what can she move. To. But the one that could move the middle could be the ICOS Il, uh, Iluma, Iluma, I think. Yeah, I think it's called ICOS Iluma. So to give you a back background, uh, ICOS is a heated cigarette. That means rather than smoke, you actually heat the tobacco. So there's no smoke, uh, actually. It's just heating tobacco. It did well when launched in 2019, but there was some uh, patent infringement by BAT, so they stopped. Right now, they're trying to come back in to sell into the US, calling it the ICOS Iluma or Lu, uh, yeah, and that should uh, Philip Morris actually guiding it to come in the second half of twenty five. Uh, they are still trying to wait. They are still waiting for FDA approval. So if that happens, then I think they could cause a big pickup in venture share price if they get approval in the US, because they are applying it through the modified risk reduction, saying that if you use this, then you less harmful than smoking tobacco. I uh, I have no idea if that's true or not, but. That's the claim. Okay, uh, thank you, Darren, and the meaning of beta. Yeah. So, so beta is virtually just volatility. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that's the best measure of risk, but I need it's volatility. Is Kepa DC... Uh, okay, I'll leave it to Darren for that. View on Raffles Medical. So Raffles Medical, we still think it's going to be tough. Could be tough for the next 12 months. They did well because they, they benefited... Or not to benefit, they managed to get a, extra revenue from the, from the pandemic happened, the transitional care facilities... Uh, basically, the public when the public hospitals had overflow of patients, especially COVID, they sent it to them. So they set up, I think, a hundred or two hundred beds. I'm not uh, just slip my mind, but but right now it's going to be tough. I think they don't have the big. They they are not capturing the very high complex cases in my own view. I mean, they do have, of course, but not as much as you as you can see the performance from Singapore IHH refers uh IHH. It definitely outperform uh, Raffles Medical. So I think a lot of the complex cases, I think, is going to RHH rather than Raffles Medical. Uh, one clue about this is, no, I think Raffles Medical still want to do public jobs. Right? No, but uh, I mean, if your hospital is in Bugis, uh, it's a very prime area. Do you really need to do government jobs? Right now? Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. We have a great memory. Changin Kiati to Bell State. Yeah. Uh, okay, what's your view on Samcorp Marine Citrum? I'm a bit worried of Citrum, even though they got, uh, I think, 6 billion, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, contract, the share price went up and then still co collapsed back down. Uh, I, I, I think they have trouble realigning their costs. Uh, yeah, I think that's my own view. I think that's, when they had the, when they got the contracts, of course, the market was from Petrobras. The market was was uh, elated, uh, obviously, but when the results came out, I think the market just getting worried whether they can actually turn turn profitable because they are technically still net loss because they're still burdened with a lot of heavy costs from the old yards and also their costs in Singapore is still really high. So I think that's the 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 worry that the market have. So uh, I mean, uh, I mean near term is still very negative on Citrum. Yeah, I, I'll I'll hand it to Darren to answer Capo DC and to close it. Thank, thanks, Darren. Yeah, thanks. For, yeah, so just one last question. Uh, is Capital DC overpriced now in view of earnings dilution due to issuance of new units and how does it compare to um, Digital Core in terms of valuations? Yeah, so in terms of valuations, Digital Core, its price to NAV is about 0 0.9 times compared to Capital DC rates, 1 point, oh, sorry, 1.5 or 1 1.6 times. So that is the valuation. So, in terms of that, Capital DC already loses out. And in terms of dividend yield, um, Capital DC right now, it we, we forecast about $0.09. Cents, so that is that translates to about a 4% dividend yield only based on the current share price. So 
basically your question is capitalism overpriced now we we think so um but it's not so much a fact that is that in view of the earnings dilution due to issuance of new units yeah the issuance of new units it is definitely dilutive because it was issued at about 1, 180 190 that price right now it's already two dollar sixteen for capitalism share price so it is dilutive but the fact that we have a target price of 193 and capital DC is still facing some headwinds like non-collection of the income from China, which accounts for about 10% of their income. Yeah, and I think maybe the market um, was too bullish on the fact that they ventured into Japan and as well as a 40% reversion for their co-location asset in Singapore. Yeah, but I think definitely the share price has, has overrun, has run its course. As our target price, as I repeat, is uh, 1.93. One dollar ninety three cents. Yeah, so so that's our view. Yeah, I think that's all for the questions for, and that brings us to the close, or rather to the end of this week's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again next week. Thanks for your questions, and yeah, we have a LMS compliance webinar this Wednesday. Yeah, so hope to see you again next week. Uh, eleven or eight eight p.m. Uh, sorry, eight a.m. Yeah, thanks. Bye bye.